Hello, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us today for our fourth and final installation of our series, CSI Keyboards. Um, my name is Ali Cade, and I'm the curator of Woodwinds here at the SMM. And I'm Tom Strange. I'm now executive director for Sigma Music Museum and the, the uh, curator for the Keyboard Institute. And of course, before we get started, we would like to once again thank the SC Humanities, the Metropolitan Arts Council, uh, MAC, and Alan Etheridge, and also the Elise Sigal Education Fund for their generous support um, that has made this series possible for the past four months. Um, so for those of you who joined for earlier lectures, welcome back. And for those who are tuning in for the first time, uh, we'll recap what we've been investigating um, throughout the past four months through CSI Keyboards. Um, so throughout this series, um, we've been giving you a closer look at the ins and outs of keyboard instruments, which were some of the most technologically complex objects of their time. Um, and we're discussing how museums interact with these objects today. We'll explore how curators and conservators work together to best display, interpret, and care for keyboard instruments and how they can better inform us of a musical past. And like any object, investigating and understanding these musical instruments begins with a CSI-like approach, um, to read the object like a document and search for evidence to understand materials, craftsmanship, ornament, and identity of the maker. These questions can be answered at various points in the investigative process, but sometimes they're never answered. Musical instruments were not made to sit silent, and they're highly personal and dynamic objects. Closely investigating the evidence and contextualizing the history enables us to make the best decision that we can to interpret the object today. And to finish out the series, we'll be joined once again by guest scholar John Watson, who will speak to the different points in preventative conservation pertinent to this upright piano made by John Isaac Hawkins around 1805. The instrument is actually just behind us here, and it's featured in our latest exhibition, Sensational Sigil. So I'm gonna briefly inter introduce John. Um, John works as an independent conservator and maker of keyboard instruments. And in 2016, he retired from the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, where he served as the conservator and curator of musical instruments for 28 years. John's research has focused on issues of musical instrument conservation, and he's published key books on the subject, including Artifacts in Use, the Paradox of, Restora the Paradox of Restoration and the Conservation of Organs. So we're, we're at, we'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but now we are going to turn our attention to the Hawkins piano and unpack what's going on both inside and out. Okay, well, we're ending our series with a fascinating instrument created by an even more fascinating man. This instrument embodies the story of John Isaac Hawkins, a polymath of sorts, prolific inventor, and one of the most interesting characters in American and British history, in my opinion. Immersed in a variety of fields, Hawkins invented all manners of objects throughout his life, working between both England and America, and crossing paths with influential individuals who helped grow his sphere. Next slide. Hawkins was born in 1772 near the town of Taunton in Somerset, east of London. He was the son of a watchmaker, which likely gave him an early understanding of the intricacies of tools, mechanical art, and problem solving. The family moved to London, um, and a few years later, this is a quick one, um, John Isaac left England for the former colonies, now a fledgling New Republic, around 1790, and landed in New Jersey to begin studies at the College of Music, New Jersey, now Princeton. Um, and though he initially attended for medicine, his interest in the mechanical arts continued to grow, and he dabbled with water filtration techniques. Next slide. Hawkins married and remained in the Northeast, jumping between Bordentown, New Jersey, and Philadelphia. In the city, Hawkins was able to grow his circle to include the likes of celebrated American portrait artist Charles Wilson Peale and sons Rembrandt and Raphael, also painters. He, he also connected with the chaplain of the House of Representatives, Reverend Burgess Allison, who also tinkered with invention, and also with then Vice President and later President Thomas Jefferson. Next slide. Hawkins collaborated with the Peels in various ways throughout his time in America. Charles Wilson Peel, who also worked as a naturalist and scientist, truly embodying the ideals of the Enlightenment 
and actually created the first museum in the, in the United States um, in Philadelphia. Hawkins worked with Peel to invent an improved polygraph and displayed some of his later inventions at Peel's museum. These relationships put Hawkins in step with a larger network of artists, politicians, craftspeople, and scientists throughout the New Republic, often working in partnerships to produce his inventions, uh, selling his patents before moving on to the next venture, Hawkins created a transatlantic web of innovation. Next slide. Beyond endeavors in musical instruments, multifaceted inventions throughout Hawkins' life included a physiognotrace on the left, which created silhouettes, um, a cheaper and more accessible way to achieve your likeness in an age before photography. In the middle, we have the Hawkins slash Charles Wilson Peel polygraph. And on the right, we have an early mechanical pencil. This entire list of inventions is too long to mention, um, but highlights also include trifocals um, and um, iridium tipped pens that apparently lasted forever. Um, next slide, please. Um, the Hawkins Peel polygraph uh, caught the attention of Thomas Jefferson, ever the inventor himself, whom Peel had painted in 1791. Peel's son Rembrandt would paint this well known portrait of an older Jefferson in 1800. Jefferson acquired one of the polygraphs and made constant use of it throughout his life. It was one of his favorite tools. However, the polygraph is not the only link between Jefferson and John Isaac Hawkins. They had already been in contact regarding a different Hawkins invention, the upright piano. Next slide. In February of 1800, Jefferson, who was in Philadelphia at the time, sends a letter to his daughter Patsy. He says, a person here has invented the prettiest improvement to the forte piano I have ever seen. It has tempted me to engage one for Monticello, partly for its excellence and convenience, partly to assist a very ingenious, modest, and poor young man who ought to make a fortune by his invention. His strings are perpendicular so that the instrument resembles, when closed, under half a bookcase. It scarcely gets out of tune at all. Next slide, please. Um, now, Jefferson's glee at the instrument's ability to stay in tune takes a sharp turn as evident in his next letter um, in April of 1802, when Jefferson is now president. He says, the forte piano which you made for me and which I had great reason to be satisfied with on every account but one has from a single cause become entirely useless. I mean that of not staying in tune. <laughs> At first, it would remain an intolerable tune for a day or two, and I hoped that when all its parts should take the set, which they might have a tendency when new, that it would become settled and hold its tune, but it grew worse and worse, till at length it would not stay in tune one single hour, and in that situation has continued to continued upwards of a 12 months, so that it is entirely disused. I am shortly going to Monticello, and I had a thought, if you approved, for it to be securely packed and sent to you in Philadelphia to be cured of this defect, if possible, and return to me when in order. So Jefferson did end up sending the instrument back to Hawkins, but indicated that he heard of and was interested in the Hawkins claviole, which is pictured on the left, um, which is an instrument that made sound with circular bows and not entirely dissimilar to a hurdy gurdy, but it also had a keyboard. Next slide. Hawkins returned to England in 1803, telling Jefferson in a letter that he would be receiving property to the death of a relative. Early on, he continued to try to manufacture his upright pianos, with work occurring at his residence at Selby Terrace in Islington and also in Golden Square near the Broadwood Warehouse. Throughout the subsequent decades, Hawkins seemed to have focused less on his upright piano and on and other musical instruments, working as a patent agent, getting involved with sugar manufactories, and working as a civil engineer, part of an early effort to dig a tunnel under the Thames. Now that didn't work for Hawkins, but it does work a couple decades later, which is pictured here on the screen. Um, however, he struggled to make ends meet and ultimately returned to New Jersey between 1848 and 1850, living with his, with his third wife, who was considerably younger, um, and he died in 1855, never quite hitting that financial jackpot throughout his various inventive schemes. Next slide. Looking back on Hawkins' colorful legacy, he was not a conventional instrument maker. Hawkins himself was not a craftsman. He did not have the years of training required to produce competent cabinetry for his upright. He conceptualized his instruments and other inventions and then worked with someone else to actually bring them forth. 
So a big question has remained, who actually made Hawkins instruments? Next slide. There are three surviving instruments by Hawkins. The oldest is in the collection of the Smithsonian, labeled as being made in Philadelphia, number six in 1801. This is the only surviving one made in the United States um, and its American origin is asserted in this eagle clad main board. Next slide. The second is similar in many ways to the American instrument, sporting the same paneled lower case, but it was made in London, now showing King George III's royal coat of arms, which was in use between 1801 and 1816, with the act of union between Great Britain and Ireland in 1801, and before the electorate of Hanover became a kingdom in 1816. After this change, the, the electoral bonnet on top of the uh, in escutcheon, um, you can click the uh, in escutcheon was changed to a crown. It's a very small change, but it does happen. Um, next slide. And the third instrument, which is the topic of this lecture, um, it's quite different in appearance than the previous two surviving instruments. It's much more elaborate in ornament, featuring elements of the classical and Egyptian revivals. It also possesses the same pre-1816 royal coat of arms with very similar style and detail across the cartouche. Next slide. Recent discoveries in conversation with some of our fellow UK-based scholars has shed some light on the possible makers in England. Using the name boards as a clue, we can place them in context with other makers in the city using similar designs. These include John Hills and William Edwards, who are working near each other south of the river. Though formatted on the horizontal name board of the square piano, we can see their name boards bear the pre-1816 heraldry with matching detail of the animal's forms and faces, supported by the same platform with a fleur-de-lis underneath, surrounded by the swags of berry clad vines on either side. Next slide. Located south of the Thames, they live nearby one another and clearly shared a painter for their nearly identical name boards. Um, click once. Um, however, none of these makers, including Hawkins, had received a, war a royal warrant of appointment that would have permit them to use the royal coat of arms on their products. Clearly, these makers knew what would slip under the radar, especially during the last tumultuous years of King George III's reign. Next slide. It remains a mystery at this point as to who made the American instrument, so we shall continue to look into that as time goes on. Um, in form, the instrument is one of the first extant upright pianos where the strings actually reach the floor, which is different than the upright grand piano seen on the left where the strings begin at the height of the keyboard. The first upright piano where the strings did reach the floor can be attributed to Robert Walkington of Dublin, who made this instrument in 1790. The Hawkins also falls into a unique range of instruments made in both Europe and America that are hidden within pieces of furniture. Somewhat of a novelty, musical instruments have been put inside of things like a peer table, a secretary, and a chest of drawers. Um, and when, when the Hawkins is closed, it looks like a sideboard, especially the upper portion of the case, creating a sort of bonnet for dishes. Next slide. On the decorative front, this instrument exhibits ornaments celebrating the classical and Egyptian revivals. Um, with pan cherubs and sphinx-like creatures. These are ormolu appliques gilded on the outside to create that striking contrast between the figured wood. Next slide. Uh, the top of the shelf possesses a brass rim of a Greek key, a popular trim seen on our 19, early 19th century Robert Warnham uh, lyre de car. Next slide. Napoleon's Egyptian campaign in 1798 ushered in the era of Egyptian revival within the decorative arts and architecture. While the trend is slightly more prevalent in the later 19th century, especially outside of architectural structures, Hawkins' commitment to be on the cutting edge of technology and ideas makes it unsurprising that he may have hooked onto the explorations of Egypt earlier than most. Next slide. And like an Egyptian sarcophagus, this instrument has so many more layers to explore inside. So now we will turn to Tom, and he will take us on a journey to explore Hawkins innovations from within. All right, and let me just start with this slide and saying that the, the go on back, please. Uh, yeah, the, the Battle of the Nile uh, captured everybody's imagination, and all things Egyptian became, you know, sort of a rage. 
And so it's, it's very interesting to see these Egyptian motifs showing up on this piano right about the time when it's at its maximum popularity. Uh, it was a clever idea for Walton to do that. So, uh, you know, good for him. Uh, and now we're going to look a little deeper uh, into the Hawkins piano. So next slide, please. Keep going. So the instrument today, uh, the Hawkins Upright is one of the most published pianos in existence. Its image and brief description has been published in piano history books for over 100 years. And good for us that it was that we have thought of Hawkins uh, for so many years as the, the inventor of the upright piano. I think it's one of the reasons that these pianos have actually survived to the, the present. Uh, it is unique in the building tradition of pianos. There's nothing like it exists by any other builder. And it makes use of a minimum of 11 fundamental innovations seen for the first time in a piano, including a full iron frame and tension struts, a suspended soundboard, a micro tuning system, a folding keyboard, and as you dig in, it kind of goes on and on. So let's look a little deeper into the piano. Here's uh, an engraving from 1884 of this piano uh, when it was in the collection of Broadwood and Sons. Um, the piano is closed up in this image, uh, but it's striking that uh, the engraver has done a very good job. And when we compare it to the actual photograph, uh, it holds up extremely well. Note the red arrow that points to one of the bottom panels. That panel is almost certainly a fabric covered panel in this case. It's clearly meant by the artist to, to uh, discriminate between it and the wood surfaces. And so if we'll go to the next picture, uh, as seen in an engraving in Alfred Dolge's uh, book of 1810, so I'll say the engraving here is somewhere between 1800 and the, uh, or 1900 and 1910, excuse me. Uh, we see the front of the piano, the, the keyboard has been opened. Uh, you see the name board uh, and the, the name plaque that we talked about. Uh, there are no panels to the right and left of that. We can see the action inside from this engraving. And so there were once panels there and those panels are for whatever reason missing, they've been removed uh, in this picture. Next, next picture. So uh, Rosamund Hardy uh, included this piano in her book, uh, which was a, a groundbreaking effort on the uh, uh, forte piano. Uh, and here it is uh, pictured circa 1930. And we can see in the bottom that there's some sort of cloth panels in place. We can see at the top that there's some sort of mahogany panels in place. And then if you look over to the side on the right, you'll see uh, with those uh, panels all removed, uh, the hammers are in place. And although it looks a little regular, uh, the piano appears to still be intact. Now, at some point uh, after Harding's uh, book, uh, she was involved in presenting uh, this piano to uh, uh, Cecil Colt, Charles Colt in uh, uh, the UK. And it was with the Colt collection for an undisclosed amount of time uh, when it was then you know, later uh, returned, I think, to Broadwood and Sons when they were clearing out all of their uh, materials and uh, it came up for auction. Somewhere between when it was photographed here and the next time we see it, uh, catastrophe has occurred. So next slide, please. Here we see the instrument today. Uh, and you can see now that there are no cloth panels in the bottom. There are these lovely uh, mahogany panels that have been put in. They don't really match the mahogany for the rest of the piano, but somebody's done an effort to make them a little closer. And then up at the top, there are two panels that I think uh, that flank that name uh, uh, insignia area that I think were probably also fabric to begin with as well. If we go to the next slide, I've done a little Photoshop to sort of show where I think the fabric panels would have been. So you can kind of clearly get an idea of what was going on. He wanted the sound to come out of this piano. Uh, as it turns out, we have two Hawkins pianos, and the other one is intact well enough to get some, uh, you know, vague idea of what the sound was like. And the sound on this piano is not a large one. It's about the same as what we would get from uh, a small square piano. And uh, the, the cloth panels would have gone a long way toward helping the sound come out. So next slide, please. This is a picture from the other Hawkins piano uh, where the fabric is still intact. I suspect 
from the color of this that the fabric on both pianos was the same before, a sort of a top colored silk. And uh, this, uh, this silk uh, is still there. Uh, there's been a lot of bug damage, but uh, it's, it's still in place. Next slide. So here's an image on the left of the piano today uh, compared to the photograph from 1930. And you can see uh, that lo and behold, the, most of the action uh, seems to be missing. The action was uh, comprised of cast brass pieces, uh, very intricately thought out, lots of drilled holes and, and the holes leaving only a little bit of brass on either side. At some point, probably during a move, uh, the brass broke. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll just show briefly that the, the panels below, uh, I think at one point swiveled out uh, they have been crudely glued together, and we're going to leave them the way they are, but they've been joined together, and I think before they were intended to swing out separately. There are some uh, witness marks for pivot holes that look like the doors once fit into that. Next slide, please. So here's the action, uh, a drawing from Harding uh, at the time when the action was still intact, and as you can see, she did a very good job of uh, reconstructing this, uh, this action. The uh, points, the arrows on the right-hand side that point to the, the brass triangular piece show where it broke. Uh, when it broke, the action uh, collapsed into the bottom of the piano uh, and everything about it was rather delicate and, and very finely uh, made. So it was unable to survive whatever it was that happened. Uh, the, the entire action broke up the hammers became separated from their shanks. Uh, when Marlow purchased the instrument, he purchased it complete. But when it arrived from England, uh, at least one box that in included all the remains of the hammers was missing, never to be found, as well as some pieces of veneer. So just to mention again, even when an instrument is crated, and, uh, and everything put together, moving these things is probably one of the hardest things on them. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, with Harding's drawing, I uh, indicated with some arrows some of the more interesting aspects that, that uh, Hawkins is using, uh, including uh, he's got a, a, the, the jack system. You see that little three-fingered thing near the end that comes off the end of the key lever. Uh, that's fairly unique. I've never seen that done before for adjusting the exact position of the jack. Um, it's, it's sort of set up so that you can get a really fine tension control on that. Uh, we typically see that done with merely a block of, of leather and cloth uh, that, that are covered behind it. Uh, the lowest arrow points to a, a large chunk of lead that's attached to the back of the key. Uh, the key levers are quite short on this piano, and in order to make it sort of balance out, uh, he's had to, to put a fair amount of lead uh, into the keys. And then uh, up at the top, uh, there's a damper system, uh, damper release system that is also uh, unique. We've never seen this done before. Most of the dampers, uh, if we go to the next picture, we can see that most of the dampers uh, still survive. Uh, the, the uh, carpet beetles have been at them and a great deal of the wool has been eaten away. Uh, on the action uh, side itself, we can see the butt for the hammers. Uh, they're pretty much still all attached to the rod or they're all still with the instrument. But a lot of the leather has been subjected. It looks like it got wet. It looks like it got wet and stayed wet for a considerable amount of time. The leather is, is badly degraded uh, more so than you would expect from just time. I'm pretty sure that we're looking at time and water. Also uh, a fair amount of the glue joints let loose and that also indicates a lot of water. And then on the far right, uh, we see some of these uh, cast brass pieces that have the, the cloth that's actually stitched through holes in the brass to hold the cloth on. So while it might have been an innovative design, it was by no means an easy design to go off and build. The next slide. Inside the piano, uh, innovation uh, awaits everywhere again. There's little brass latches and hooks for holding onto the action and releasing it so that the action could have been taken out. Uh, and I think, like the other Hawkins, had it not broken, uh, a fair amount of this action would still be in place. 
It does have all of its strings. Uh, a unique feature of this instrument is all the strings are the same length. And they, they start at the top and they go all the way to the bottom. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see that uh, here's a kind of a, a drawing schematic of what's going on. Uh, all of these pieces are there to indicate uh, an iron structure. And I've left some colors to highlight how the iron was assembled together. It's not a cast uh, iron piece. These are all wrought iron and they're all bolted together. Uh, the idea is, is fairly competent. Uh, you, you've not only got the tension across the iron frame, but then you've got the uh, tension uh, uh, joins on the back so that you can actually put tension back on the iron and, and hold it. Uh, I have a feeling that if uh, he had been not so concerned with portability, and that was one of the big selling points of this piano was that it was lightweight and portable. Uh, a little bit of wood added uh, to the sides and around the rim of this uh, iron frame might have gone a long way toward helping Mr. Jefferson and that tuning problem. Next slide. So here we can see the back of the piano and there you see the, the iron frame uh, with the, the, the joins as I showed. The uh, top arrow, uh, red arrow on the left-hand side is showing the cutoff bar. The right is showing one of the ribs. And then the soundboard, which is about six centimeters, about a half an inch thick, fairly thick for an instrument that would normally be more like four to five millimeters thick. But uh, the grain all runs uh, from right to left. Uh, and so we, we have the thing set up so that uh, it's, it's a, a little counterintuitive to the way music or soundboards are normally laid out with their strings. Uh, next image. Just to show the other Hawkins, uh, you can see it's cut off for a little bit different. Uh, the iron frame is showing here. And if we go to the next picture, uh, there's the, the top of the tensioning. But notice that on the inside, there's hardly anything else inside this piano. So it is a very, very lightweight sort of instrument. Next picture. Uh, here is uh, another feature. The, the nut is a cast iron segment with the pins driven in. So we have a, a true cast iron here uh, running from right to left. Uh, that's the entire nut. And in this case, you can see where in the Hawkins piano we're talking about, the soundboard has actually cracked along the grain. And that allows you to kind of get an idea of just how thick the soundboard is. So very thick indeed, three strings per note throughout. And uh, you know, once again, the idea of having all the strings the exact same length is, is fairly unusual in piano manufacturing. Next picture. Uh, here's the tuning system. Once again, something new. Uh, well, what we have is like a little micro tuner. Uh, the, the little uh, heads on there up, uh, at the top are between two and a half and three millimeters uh, wide. And so a very, very small uh, slender key would fit in here. And as you turn the screw, it would move that, that little armature up and down the screw, thus changing the tension. Uh, at one point he had claimed uh, where all three strings would be tuned at once, but in all the extant pianos that we have, the three strings are independently tuned. Next picture. And then a folding keyboard. Why not? If, if we're gonna do everything else strange, let's do this. So uh, the keyboard is set up to fold in and then with uh, uh, bespoke brass pieces to allow the keyboard to uh, lock into place and thus disguise it and hide it as being the piano when it's not in service. Next picture. And here we can see that a little bit better. Here's the keyboard folded all up and one of these brass catches. Uh, also uh, on the top, uh, in order to tune, there's a way to raise the lid and then a little arm that comes over and catches the lid, holds it up while you're tuning. Next picture. So the, the piano disappears once it's folded up. And this was sort of critical for really, really fine houses where pianos were something of a uh, tinker's work box. And the idea was once you finish making the music, let's fold all this up and sort of have it out of sight and out of mind. Uh, there's no pedals on this piano and no evidence that this piano ever had a pedal. The other Hawkins that we have does have the evidence of a pedal that was there that was a damper control. Next picture. 
So just to reiterate what Ellie has said, uh, I, I want to point out that the, the Edwards, uh, the Hills, and the Phillips uh, main boards that have the same design are really fairly unusual. Those are the only three makers uh, in, in London all making about exactly the same time that we know of that use you know that particular uh, set of imagery uh, you know the the lion and the unicorn um, unicorn looks pretty much like what we would expect I doubt the artists had ever seen a lion but uh, they were having a good time with it and next image and then uh, Ali had already mentioned it but the classical motifs are are, are just wonderful on this instrument uh, they are made up of cast brass that has been, uh, you know, not so much plated, but oh, gold has been applied through one of these, you know, gold mercury amalgams that you put on and then you drive the, the mercury off and it leaves the gold behind. And it does a very good job of leaving a, a very tough gold surface behind. And uh, these are still pretty nicely intact. And then I'm going to finish up by saying that uh, as we dug through the remains of this piano, which were uh, put in, in just some shoe boxes and uh, the long pieces left in the bottom of the piano, uh, you know, I found a carpet beetle larva still alive. I found a couple of adults. Uh, you know, in museums, we hate to see this sort of thing. And this was one of those situations where, although we had checked this uh, instrument out uh, when it came from the shippers, uh, I didn't check it out when we brought it into the museum. And so apparently we had some eggs, the eggs hatched. Uh, we had some larva. I think we, we caught it at a very early stage, but it just reiterates once again that uh, ultra care and concern as these instruments move around, not only from the fragility, of the instrument itself, but what it can bring in with it when you let the cat back in. So here's a, just a little uh, you know, reminder that we must always be careful with everything that comes into the museum environment. So let's uh, let's pick up on that uh, that carpet beetle a bit and talk a little bit about um, preventive conservation. Uh, if I can just um, share my screen. Okay, so we will start with uh, some wise words from another inventor of uh, musical instruments, Benjamin Franklin, who said an ounce of preservation is worth a pound of cure. Hmm? Um, and I think he said it all right there. And I can, um, I can sign it back to uh, Tom and Ali, <laughs> I will elaborate a bit. In museums, it's a major issue uh, to keep, uh, keep an eye on all the ways that objects uh, age over time. And that's the goal of preventive conservation is slowing the aging process. It's not at all passive. It's not a matter of just leaving the instrument uh, or the objects alone, it's hard work. And it's, uh, it's mother nature that you're trying to hold back. And we can slow the effects of time, but we certainly can't, uh, can't stop it. So have a look at this picture and think to yourself, what's wrong in this picture? Some people might say, well, the piano is um, disemboweled and uh, needs some restoration work. But what we're, what we're going to do when we think about preventive conservation is not look at the object, but look at the space around it. Uh, and in this case, uh, we can see a number of issues going on. In fact, um, what uh, conservation scientists have uh, spent a great deal of effort working on is to understand what are the agents of decay uh, and there are many of them at work in this uh, in this image. These are insidious threats to our collections, and it takes a great deal of effort to hold them at bay. Uh, our obligation uh, for the next generation is to try to slow the effect of aging. 
there's a lot of uh, publication books uh, and uh, professionals specializing in preventive conservation uh, in museums. Here are two books. The one on the left is an American publication, Caring for Your Collections, uh, by the National Committee to Save America's Cultural Collections. The other is uh, a British publication by the, um, by the National Trust uh, called a Manual of Housekeeping. And this, uh, this book occupies a couple inches of my shelf space. It's a full 940 pages. It's a huge subject. Not a page of this book is about how to restore anything. It's all about how to avoid the necessity of uh, correcting the uh, damage caused by these agents of decay. I looked around uh, at the instruments. I have a few here in my house. And one of them uh, is, a, is a piano made by James Ball in about 1808. And it has this uh, sticker in it. It's an example of a very early um, um, suggestion about preventive conservation. It says, not to be kept too near the fire, nor when the sun can have much power on them, but in as regular heat as possible. Uh, that's a very brief uh, statement of preventive conservation. And we'll have a look at um, the issues of fire and sun and heat uh, in a, in a moment. But actually, you can see a couple of other agents of decay at work on uh, this, on this uh, piece of paper. The silverfish have begun to eat away at some spots. You can see those light colored areas and water has uh, stained. And you can see the tide lines from, uh, from when it got wet. When you think about it, a musical, a keyboard instrument is a fantastic habitat for all kinds of uh, bugs and, um, and critters, uh, rodents. It's a safe environment, safe from vacuum cleaners and dust cloths and fly swatters uh, down inside the instrument. There's all kinds of cloth, as you've seen. Uh, Tom showed you a few examples. The mechanical action of a keyboard instrument is full of, uh, of little uh, bits of cloth and leather here and there to cushion the sounds and to act as hinging material and so forth. And the wood itself is, uh, is uh, good food for some kinds of uh, pests. We call these biological attackers uh, pests. So um, what can we do about them? Let's have a look at, uh, first of all, uh, the kinds of pests that eat cloth. And we have two major uh, types that we run into in, in, uh, in America, at least. And I think uh, this is probably international. This is an example of the work of um, case making moths. This piano is one that I restored in the, 19, in the mid 1980s. And uh, two or three years later, I was called back to the house museum because it was no longer playable. And uh, when I opened it up, I saw all these little um, these little casings, as you can see in the lower right, uh, blow, uh, enlargement of one, these are the casings of the case making moth. And in the lower left, you can see the, the wool cloth that uh, was new when I did the restoration. And you could see that the, the, uh, the bugs, the insects had eaten it almost completely away. You can see some of the telltale um, ca uh, casings uh, down in that picture. Another common problem for all wooden instruments is the powder post beetle. We run into that uh, quite often, and it probably more than uh, almost anything else, uh, a kind of uh, terminal um, condition issue for musical instruments. The uh, one in the upper right is a minor infestation. That's a, a, a part of it an organ bellows from 1799. And it was just a little uh, little area that uh, had gotten uh, uh, the powder post beetle. And you can see it just absolutely turns the, the wood to, uh, to dust. And in the picture straight below it is, uh, is a detail from the hitch pin uh, plank of, the, um, of a, a gainer square piano uh, that I have. 
and it was very badly infested with um, with uh, uh, wood boring beetles. And you can see the little flight holes about a millimeter in diameter all over. And uh, and actually in this raking light, you could see that the uh, top of the the um, wood is paper thin and and it's just buckling because it the the uh, the top layer has almost nothing to connect to the same instrument in the lower left is the keyboard when you take a key out uh, most often the the uh, the balance pin just comes right with the key because the balance rail below is completely riddled by uh eaten away by powder post beetles it's just uh, it's just mostly powder it may look at first like it's intact and you just see the little round flight holes, but, um, but it just is, is uh, there's almost nothing left and no integrity to the, the material. When instruments have had that kind of infestation, they really cannot be restored. Uh, there are ways you can consolidate using uh, various kinds of uh, uh, resins, epoxies and so forth. And um, you might be able to, make it solid again, but it certainly wouldn't have the same characteristics. The material wouldn't behave the same. So this is really, um, this is really an unrestorable instrument. And yet it's important in my collection because it has an innovative action design. Um, one of the only examples I know of an uh, of English single action that has um, an escapement scheme. So um, let's see what's next here. Rodents. Um, rodents uh, love keyboard instruments because they could usually find their way in. And there's lots of food in there. Um, you can see in the uh, upper right, a mouse hole in a um, 17, circa 1714 spinet. And uh, at the uh, bottom and left are both the same uh, instrument, the upright grand piano combined with a uh, pipe organ. And you can see in the lower picture where mice have, uh, have eaten through the pipes. They eat just about everything. And in the lower left is, uh, is uh, one of the mice mouse uh, nests being cleaned out. This is an instrument in my workshop right now. It's a square piano. And it, what's interesting about it is that you can see where mice have chewed away at the corner. And uh, it was actually, you see this, uh, this inset of wood. It was actually uh, damaged by mice, replaced uh, with new wood, and then mice again damaged it. And then after that, it was uh, just varnished over and um, and so there was a long history of uh, problems with mice in this instrument, even after it was repaired. Moisture is uh, one of the agents of decay that we run across all the time. Tom mentioned this already with the uh, Hawkins piano. Uh, high humidity is, um, is the cause of, um, of mold. And this is an example of an 1800 grand piano that uh, in a house museum uh, they called me in. They had just a brief period uh, when their dehumidification equipment broke down, and that was enough for this uh, heavy accumulation of of, uh, of mold and mildew that uh, had to be uh, cleaned off. And rust, of course, is another consequence. Uh, too too much dryness and soundboards split, particularly soundboards because they're limited. They're not free to contract as they dry out. They're glued all the, right, all the way around the perimeter and uh, they split. Uh, well, I have uh, hardly scratched the surface. There are many other agents of decay at hard work on our instruments. And uh, it's, uh, it's a whole science. Many museums have uh, full-time professionals that are devoted just to paying attention to, uh, to all those agents of decay and trying to keep them at bay. And so I'll leave it for you to uh, Google that and, and learn all about it. And I'll turn this back over to Tom and Ali. All right. Thank you, John. That was excellent. So, uh, you know, a, a question, you know, might well come up, you know, well, what are you going to do with the Hawkins piano behind us? 
And uh, I think the answer hopefully is fairly straightforward. Uh, our plan right now, of course, is to, to do nothing. Uh, we, we have gone through the preventative conservation steps to make sure it's in a good environment. Uh, I have made sure that there's no more active bugs inside. We took all of those bits and pieces and categorized them and segregated them. Uh, they've gone into to poly bags and then they're gonna go into archival boxes that will be labeled and that will stay with the instrument. So I think what we have done is stabilize what we have so far. Um, I still think there's a great deal of uh, information to learn from this instrument. Oh, for sure. And so we're gonna go you know, uh, mining again, particularly when uh, we can compare the two instruments side by side. Um, I just wanted to bring up, since, since John had, uh, and Ali had brought this up earlier, uh, there are two great books that I would recommend. Uh, one of them is uh, by John himself, the Artifacts in Use book. Uh, if you don't have this in your library and you're probably watching this show, <laughs> you probably need this This is the book. one to get. This is a great book to get. I would also recommend uh, Robert Barclay's The Preservation and Use of Historic Musical Instruments. Some of the same arguments are presented in the Berkeley, uh, but I think in, a, in a, just a kind of a different light, it's neat to hear two different authors, you know, come at a thing. Uh, there are other books on this subject and uh, I encourage you to, to learn more. And then I will tell you that as conservationists, we're always learning something. So I believe we might have some questions. Yeah, we, we will end with uh, another question and answer session. Um, I actually have some right here that we'll get, we'll get started with. Um, so besides something really obvious like fire, um, what agents of decay can cause the most amount of damage quickly? Well, water, I think, is probably the, the next fastest uh, uh, killer of, of instruments, um, followed shortly by, uh, by being too dry and too hot. I have seen any number of pianos that were, would have otherwise been great that were put in a room that was kept at way too high a temperature and the, the poor things have dried out, cracked, and the tension causes them to collapse. John, anything to add to that? No, I, I, I agree. Uh, f fire and uh, flood are, are the two uh, radical ones. And I, I'm yeah. sure that uh, some of our, our uh, uh, folks attending from uh, San Francisco would say uh, earthquakes can do a lot of damage in a very short time too. <laughs> that, that is fair. Um, now, what kind of preventative conservation can people do on their instruments at home? Okay, John, you want to take that first? Uh, what What can they do to uh, for preventive conservation? Yeah, if at they home. just have an instrument at home. Yeah, um, well, uh, I know a 940-page book that you could read. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly, all of those all of those things, uh, humidity, keeping humidity sort of in bounds is a good thing. Um, you know, one thing that's a little counterintuitive, you think uh, that if you are comfortable, your instrument must be comfortable yeah. um, in terms of uh, temperature and, and so forth. It's not really quite true. Um, you've heard of cold storage and it's cold for a reason. A lot of the um, um, aging processes are actually chemical in nature and chemical um, processes are faster at higher temperatures. So cold is not so much a problem. And that uh, photograph of the piano up in an attic, uh, that's the opposite. That's uh, very warm and it causes uh, a lot of damage there just, just from many of the other processes, the biological types of attack are also uh, enhanced by warmth. But there's a, it, it's a, there's a great deal to it and, and just uh, housekeeping is, uh, is maybe in a word what's required. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and just to mention, if you have an artifact that is in use, that a, a piano that you love, that, that you play, then quite frankly, if you'll play it frequently, you'll have less trouble. Uh, the mice, the moths, and the beetles don't like to be disturbed. And so anything that disturbs them uh, moves them off to the next uh, available food source. And uh, so I would just encourage people to if, if it's going to be a tension and you're going to actually have it as a, a, a functioning thing, then make sure you use it. Fair enough. Next question. Um, 
you know, what kind of agents of decay can affect other types of musical instruments, such as an ivory recorder or a, a brass hunting horn? Uh, I'll, I'll just start quickly and say with something like a brass instrument, contaminants in the air, uh, particularly sulfur and, uh, and nitrates, uh, can react with the brass very, very quickly. Uh, touching it with your fingers and not cleaning it uh, is, is a quick way to you know, introduce stains. And then with ivory, uh, moisture that is left against the ivory uh, can be a problem because it swells uh, at different rates. John. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, about ivory, there's a, a kind of an interesting uh, exception in the in the case of ivory. Most things, I didn't get to the, the part of my uh, talk about the effect of light and the bleaching effect that it has on wooden artifacts, but, um, but ivory is the one thing that actually um, likes a little bit of light. It, it's uh, not, you don't want direct sunlight to get on wood, but, but keeping a keyboard instrument closed up entirely uh, will actually um, cause the ivory to yellow a bit. So keeping it open um, is okay, especially for the ivory. And it's very important though, not to let the sun uh, hit directly on the wood because it, it very rapidly causes a, a breakdown chemically of the surface and uh, creates uh, different colors. So you have a, in effect, uh, a fading. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's very difficult to reverse that fading. Uh, it, it, it really can't be done. Uh, what you wind up doing is either removing part of the surface or adding stuff that was never there. So uh, a very tough thing to do anything about. Sarah, do we have any questions from the audience? We don't have any questions, but what a comment from you. I saw one comment that uh, that somebody had, had noticed that Mason and Hamlin uh, had a tuning system very much like uh, what Hawkins had. And this is true. They, they did. Uh, it was a much more robust sort of system. But uh, I, I have seen that myself. The E string on a violin uh, you know, works a lot like the way uh, you know, Hawkins was, was doing things. So uh, it's not something that was uh, in, entirely uh, disused. Uh, we've just rarely ever see it on a piano. And John, have, have you ever seen this on a piano of this period before? Not, not, not a piano, but it was, uh, it was not, a, 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 not, a, not a huge amount of creativity to come up with the idea because it was very, fairly commonly being used on, uh, on English uh, guitars at the time. It was called watch key tuning. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, yeah. All right, we do actually have a question, another one here, um, from Carmen Stanford. Would UVC sterilizer help mitigate potential larvae of various harmful insects or rodents potentially inside incoming instruments? So like a UV light? I think so. Okay. Um, if the light can is, is of the, the very short frequency and is strong enough, perhaps, you know, once you introduce UV light, you're changing things as well. So you have to be careful that the remedy isn't worse than the, the critter itself. What I like to do for bugs is, uh, if, if there's any doubt at all, uh, put it in a deep freeze and leave it there for a couple of weeks. Uh, they can take almost anything but a deep freeze. And uh, once you've done that, the, you, you're pretty much able to take the, the item back out and uh, know that it's bug free. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, oily like treatments for powder post beetles. Uh, my impression of those things is that they do as much harm as they do good. Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 the piano reeks of this stuff and it makes, if there's any moving parts that are connecting to each other, uh, it, it just makes them impossible. So um, I think it's one of those things where you have to kind of work at it piece by piece the more you can take it apart, examine it, uh, you know, re remove, you know, the, the critters at large, the better off you're going to be. John. Uh, yeah, uh, but once infant infestation really gets uh, going, it's a it's a huge issue. It's difficult in a especially in a collection where you may have uh, dozens or hundreds of objects 
that have, uh, again, with uh, keyboard instruments, particular challenge there because it's, uh, you have to take an instrument completely apart to actually see all of the cloth down inside. Um, yeah, and, and just one other comment about the, uh, the chemical solutions for, um, for uh, powder post beetle and uh, some of those others is they, they tend to be very toxic for humans as well. So, um, so they're best to avoid. But keeping an eagle eye uh, for activity, powder post beetle, for example, um, um, the, uh, the telltale sign is a little uh, pile of uh, sawdust uh, here and there. And if you follow directly up from that pile of sawdust and you see a little one millimeter hole, you know you have an issue. Uh, sometimes you get that symptom only because the object has been handled and uh, rattled a bit and it's shaken out and it may be an old uh, inactive infestation. Uh, thankfully, mine that, that has uh, some very serious damage, that's old damage, it's inactive. But uh, new, new sawdust appearing is a major warning sign. Sawdust for death. You don't want yes. that. <laughs> You'd like to avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> um, do we have any other any other queries for now? All right. Well, folks, um, if you do have other questions, you can post them underneath the video that will be on Facebook, um, and this will also go on YouTube. So you can um, ask your questions there. Um, anyone watching this in the future, um, we will you know, be looking at those things, and we can answer anything further um, as we monitor it um, over time. Um, but other than that, um, we are we have reached the end of our, our series here. Uh, we hope to do another series in the future. So stay tuned for um, our our plans for that. You can check we are our, we are planning it now, and it will cover some very different sort of material. So check our keep checking our social media and our website for information on on how to get that um, once we roll that information out. Um, but we will also keep you updated uh, with the instruments that we've covered throughout the series if we are doing, making any um, decisions about them or, um, you know, find something new, find out something new. So um, just stay tuned. Uh, we will, this is not going to just end here today. This will continue to live on. So um, thank you again for watching. We are so glad we were able to do this. Um, and thank you, John, for participating over the past for a series, um, you've been an invaluable part of it. So, all right. Well, I think we will end with that um, and enjoy the rest of your Sunday, folks. <laughs>